I'm in Manchester, England today. I'm speaking with Professor Harold Zurhausen, who's the recipient of the SGM Medal Prize this year. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thanks for speaking with me today. It's my pleasure. Well, I'm curious to know how you became interested in viruses. Well, that's an old love of mine since my student time. Mm -hmm. Not really, not necessarily viruses, but I was interested in infections and cancer. Uh -huh. So I was very much intrigued initially by the idea that uh, bacteria may pick up phages, mm -hmm. bacterial viruses, and that the genomes persist in those cells. Right. And they may occasionally be spontaneously lysed by these agents. And so I thought, uh, must have been during my second part of my medical studies that this might be a nice idea mm -hmm. whether cancer might have a similar origin. Right. So in a way throughout my lifetime I was not so much interested in to a specific let's say family of viruses although we worked for more than 30 years on one of them more I was much more interested in the causation of specific human cancers by infectious agents. Okay. I would have worked with bacteria as well if <laughs> there would have been a good well, opportunity. Some bacteria cause cancers, sure. the helicobacter, uh, helicobacter right? but right. that was long after you got started. Yes, that's true. So you spent some time in the United States, right? I spent uh, a couple of years in the United States, three and a half years in Philadelphia at the Children's Hospital in the virus mm -hmm. laboratory there. It was a great period. For Did me. you know Hilary Kaprowski? Absolutely, yes, I know <laughs> her very well, yes. Did you like Philadelphia? I, it was a most stimulating <laughs> time for me. Mm -hmm. As a young postdoc, I came to the States and uh, uh, I had some background in virology, but it was a very basic type of background. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a chance to start instantly to work on viruses which are really linked to some degree to human cancer, right. like Epstein Barr virus. Right. I worked on adenovirus type 12 for a while. So, in a way, it was a, quite an exciting time period. Hmm. So I understand that epidemiologically there were suggestions that viruses might be involved in cervical cancers in the 1800s. 1842, yes. Rigonistan in Verona mm -hmm. said that sexual contacts uh -huh. may have a role in uh, cervical cancer. That was a basis for assuming that a sexually transmitted agent may play right. a role. Right. So how did you get interested in cervical cancer specifically? Well, at that period of time, we had worked a lot on Epstein-Barr virus mm. findings, DNA of EBV in Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal right. carcinoma cells, and the technique worked out reasonably well, although it was a difficult virus to work at. And uh, so when the first ideas came up in the end of the 1960s, mm. 67, 68, that herpes simplex virus type 2 may be involved in cervical cancer, I thought it's an easy story for us because mm -hmm. we had all the techniques available, we could quickly clarify this issue. And so we started to work during this period of time on isolation of herpes simplex type 2 DNA and right. trying to hybridize it and so on. The data were absolutely negative. But even before this period of time, I came across an article which had the title The Human Water Virus, Papova Virus, Human Water Virus. And uh, by Mayhew and Rosen, and uh, I found this fascinating mm -hmm. just, because there was a description of some genital warts which convert into malignant tumors very rarely, but occasionally. And I thought that is quite an interesting point because could it be that an agent which occasionally causes malignant disease at the external genital sites mm -hmm. that would act slightly different at the cervical side and maybe right. an right. active cancer-inducing agent? So we set up. When I moved from, I was at that time at the University of Würzburg to the University of Erlangen, I set up a group specifically in 1972 to start to work on the isolation and characterization mm -hmm. of the viruses in genital wards. We saw quickly that there is not the human ward virus, but there are several mm -hmm. different types of human ward viruses. But it took us an enormously long period of time before we got a handle to purify the DNA of mm -hmm. genital ward viruses. The titus, the virus titus were very low in those yeah. preparations. And then, of course, the first disappointment came after we had it isolated mm -hmm. and tried to hybridize it to cervical cancer. We didn't find anything mm -hmm. in cervical cancer. But with the same probe, we isolated an agent which is closely related, HPV-11. Mm -hmm. And by using this agent among 
23 cervical cancer biopsy cells on tumor, which clearly was positive. Mm -hmm. But in addition, there were a couple of others which showed in so-called southern blood hybridizations, right. some faint bands. And so we suspected they might be related, but uh, different types of viruses right. present. And indeed, I uh, asked two of my students to look specifically to invent into those bands into two different types of tumors. Both have been highly successful. Right. The one turned out to be HPV-16, the other HPV-18. And from that moment on, the situation changed dramatically because we saw instantly that uh, about 50% of the tumors contained HPV-16 DNA, slightly more than 20% HPV-18. Mm -hmm. Today, globally, the situation is slightly different because it's somewhat slightly more than 50% 16 right. and slightly less than 20% 18. But that was clearly an exciting finding for us. And from that point on, we started to look into the mechanism. In fact, in 84, I approached companies for, pro for production of a vaccine. Right. Only one of them was interested, but they made a market analysis which turned out to be negative, and so wow. they stopped uh, funding us, uh, which mm -hmm. they did initially. So it, it turned out to be a slightly different difficult period in the later 1980s, and, but later on, of course, two American companies picked right. it up and now yeah, we have quite, quite vaccines. successfully. Yeah. Yeah. So how many human papillomaviruses are there now that we know of? At this very moment, 178. You think there are more? Characterized. Clearly there are more. There are yes. more. Yeah, this is not the limit. I mean, there are probably many more, but uh, if you look at only at those which are fully characterized, mm -hmm. as the sequences are fully known, it's 178. It's a okay. very recent data, so yeah. it must be the right figure. <laughs> so, but very few of these are associated with cervical cancers. Well, right? about something like third, between 13 and 15. It's a little bit difficult for some of, right. some of these types to clearly state whether they are linked or not. Yeah. Do we understand why only a few are linked to cancers? Uh, well, it's uh, a question which is difficult to answer. Uh, obviously, specific sequences in the so-called viral oncogenes E6 and E7 play a significant role. Right. It seems that besides these two major types, the right. other ones have longer latency periods. Mm -hmm. They're not to the same extent, apparently, oncogenic than the other two, but they are clearly, some I of see. them are clearly oncogenic as well. Okay. So in a way, uh, since in cervical cancer, the tumors usually contain DNA, viral DNA which is either partially deleted or which is methylated right. at specific sites, the virus in itself is replication incompetent in mm -hmm. these tumors. Right. And so for the virus, the persistence in a malignant tumor is not of any recognizable right. advantage. It's an accident. Right. It's an accident for the virus and it's an accident for the host cell. In fact, for most human cancers, this is the case. It's uh, an accident. For, in, basically for all human oh. cancers which are linked to infections. Right. There's not a single one where you do not need some mutations and modifications, uh, some modifications of the, right. of the uh, methylation pattern, for instance, which uh, render some genes inactive mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. agents. And in a way, as you said, said it before, it is an accident in yeah. any case. Yeah. Do you think there are other human cancers that could have a viral etiology? I suspect it very strongly, yes, yeah. that there are others. I mean, we are working presently very much, we stopped working on papillomaviruses, and we are working mainly on colon cancer mm -hmm. and on childhood leukemias. Okay. And in both instances, I think there's reasonable epidemiological ground to suspect that infections are involved, mm -hmm. most likely viral infections are involved. Okay. In the case of colon cancer, we suspect that it is these are agents which might be transmitted from cattle to humans. Hmm. Consumption of so-called red meat uh, <laughs> is, uh, should be a risk factor. And in leukemia, we suspect strongly that it's a prenatal infection, mm -hmm. which leads to immunotolerance subsequently in the infected yeah. person and which could cause this type mm -hmm. of leukemia. So you must be very proud that the work you did led to a vaccine which is saving lives. I think proud would not be the right expression for it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when you get older, and I'm reasonably old by now, then you see how many open questions still yeah. remain. And this, I think, requires some kind of, how should I say, humility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I, I'm not 
proud, really, in that sense. I'm, of course, pleased that the vaccine is working and is widely yeah. applied right now, or more widely applied right now yeah. from year to year. Uh, I feel it's very important that this is going to happen because cervical cancer is still the second most frequent malignancy yeah. globally. Yeah. So for those reasons, it is important that this is being done, but we need to do much, much more. So yesterday at one of the talks here, someone suggested it, that the HPV vaccine could be improved perhaps by using the L2 protein. Is yes, that, what yes. do you think about that? Well, that's an interesting idea. The problem is the L2 proteins is because it's covers a broad spectrum of different types of mm -hmm. papilloma viruses, particularly specific epitopes of the L2 protein. The problem was so far that the titers which can be reached by mm -hmm. applying this type of vaccine are re relatively low. Okay. And so we don't know how long they persist and to which extent they are really pro protective on the long run. But uh, basically, if it could be worked mm -hmm. out that we reach high titers by applying this vaccine, a good chances in my opinion to improve the mm -hmm. vaccines and even to prevent some of the cutaneous what, I see. Uh, virus good. infections as well. So a paper was published just this week which showed in the U.S. there are increasing numbers of parents who won't give their children the HPV vaccine. This is a disturbing trend. Absolutely disturbing. And is this the, do you know is this the case in Europe as well? Or? Uh, I would say we have rather an increasing trend of uh, uh, uptake of vaccines. But it's deplorable if yeah. this is going to happen because all the studies which have been conducted so far show that this vaccine is a, one of the very safe right. vaccines. A, there's a, no vaccine without any risk, but according to Australian studies, you can roughly calculate there's one allergy against the yeah. vaccine among 100,000 vaccinees. So in a way, this is an excellent result, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also advocating very strongly that the vaccine should be applied to boys as well. Yes. Because boys, of course, in the age between 15 and 25, are usually, have usually some more partners than their yeah. female counterparts. And they, of course, effectively transmit the viruses. But there are, of course, also cancers like in the oral pharyngeal region right. and in the anal right. region, which are linked to the same types of virus infections, which occur in males at least as frequent as in right. females. So there would be good reasons to, to vaccinate boys as well. Uh, unfortunately, in Europe, the health insurances don't pay for the vaccination of boys. They pay only for girls. Mm. I consider this as a grave mistake, and yeah. I think there should be something. We, we need to make more propaganda yeah. in order to advocate, really, the vaccination of I boys. Have, I, have, I have two boys and a girl. They all received the vaccine. My grandchildren, too. And I have to tell you a story. My younger son came home from school one day, and he said, Dad, uh, a girl in my class, her father said, you can't have the HPV vaccine because it causes polio. Oh, that's nonsense. Isn't course. that nonsense? That's it's nonsense. just an excuse. Absolutely so nonsense. So what can scientists do to counter this? Is there anything that we can help? Well, uh, I think we need to make more propaganda and we mm -hmm. also we should m more intensively point out that even the precursor lesions of this type of cancer are a nasty problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because in Germany, for instance, we have about 6,000 cases mm -hmm. of cervical cancer in a population of slightly more than 80 million people. But uh, there are 140,000 cone biopsies being taken yeah. within yeah. the same period of time. And of course, it's always it's clearly a much, much higher risk of cone sure. biopsy than a vaccination, which would prevent the, right. uh, the uh, taking of a biopsy mm. at all. So in a way, that is one aspect which needs to be brought more into the fore. But secondly, also as scientists, we have a commitment in order to propagate this type of vaccine. I do not get any income from the pharmaceutical companies for the vaccine, so I can freely talk about this. The prices are too high, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I they agree. need to be reduced. But on the other hand, the effectiveness of the available vaccines is remarkably high. And I think that needs to be communicated yes. to the public. And as you said, it's very safe. It's very safe as well. So, Dr. Zerhausen, what do you do with yourself these days? What do I do with myself? I travel too much, <laughs> I give too many lectures <laughs> at this stage, I try to keep a small group in Heidelberg mm -hmm. still active, which I could continue to have. And uh, in a way, uh, I'm too much probably involved into, in science still. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I didn't find very much time for some other hobbies which I have. 
and uh, which I regret occasionally, but not too much, I must say. Once a scientist, always a scientist. It seems so. Thank, Thank you very much, much for Thank talking you for with the, me. For I really interview. appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.